I'm gonna wait for some confirmation. All right, all right, we're we're live. Um, howdy, guys. Jimmy Song here. Welcome to another episode of White Paper Wednesday. This is a show where I read through a classic white paper that's related to Bitcoin in some way, shape, or form. And uh, and today we got a pretty good one for you. It's uh, trusted third parties are security holes by Nick Sabo, uh, the great Nick Sabo, probably one of the predecessors uh of uh, satoshi nakamoto's bitcoin in many different ways uh but uh we're gonna go read through this and uh and talk about it um i am going to do another show with tone later today and we'll talk about um some of the satoshi stuff um the coins that moved earlier and so on uh so please hold off on those questions but without further ado let's go to trusted third parties are security holes by nick sabo and this was originally published in um 2012 and basically it was uh you know i mean 2001 uh it, it, it's uh it, it's like the title says it all but uh but reading through the paper is also really really useful all right so let's uh let's get started trusted third parties are security holes by nick sabo originally published in 2001 introduction commercial security is a matter of solving the practical problems of business relationships such as privacy, integrity, protecting property, or detecting breach of contract. A security hole is any weakness that increases the risk of violating these goals. In this real-world view of security, a problem does not disappear because a designer assumes it away. The invocation or assumption is a security protocol design of a trusted third-party TTP or trusting computing, uh, trusted computing base TCB controlled by a third party con uh, constitutes the introduction of a security hole into that design. The security hole will then need to be plugged by other means. So he's defining security here. Um, essentially, you can't just sort of design uh design things away right like if, if you say well we'll assume that these people are trusted or that they're trustworthy um that doesn't mean that the security properties uh suddenly get better um you you're opening up a security hole in other words if the risks and costs of the uh, of ttp institutional alternatives were not accounted for in the protocol design the resulting protocol will in most cases be too costly or risky to be practical if the protocol beats these odds and proves practical, it will only succeed after extensive effort has gone into plugging the TTP security holes. TTP assumptions cost most of the, uh, cause most of the costs and risks in a security pro protocol, and plugging trusted third-party security holes produces the most benefit and profit. As a result, we propose a security protocol design methodology whereby the most risky and expensive parts of a security protocol, the trusted third parties, are designed in parallel with security pro protocols using those parties. The objectives of cost and risk minimization are focused on the trusted third parties rather than the security protocols themselves, which should be designed to suit the cost and risk minimized trusted third parties. We also briefly discuss and reference research and implementation in security mechanisms that radically reduce trusted third party costs and risk by distributing automated trusted third parties across several parties, only a portion of which need to act in a reliable or trustworthy manner matter uh for the protocol to be reliable or trustworthy so here is uh sort of the thing that's related to bitcoin because this is at the heart of uh of what the bitcoin network is you don't have trusted third parties as long as the majority of um of the system is behaving well then uh then they, there's a reliability in the entire network and not having to trust a single uh third party and that that's the idea that gets brought in later into bitcoin new trusted third parties are costly and risky this author has professional experience implementing a trusted third party that was assumed by early advocates of public key cryptography this trusted third party has come to be called a certificate authority ca it has been given the responsibility of vouching for the identity of participants here i focus on the costs imposed by the ttp alternatives such as uh, such as pgp's web of trust and spki have been discussed amply elsewhere the certificate authority has proved to be by far the most ex expensive component of this centralized public key infrastructure or pki 
This is exacerbated when the necessity for a trusted third party deemed by protocol designers is translated in PKI standards such as uh, SSL and SMIME into a requirement for a trusted third party. A trusted third party that must be trusted by all users of a protocol becomes an arbiter of who may and may not use that protocol. So that, for example, to run a secure SSL web server or to participate in SMIME, one must obtain a certificate from a mutually trusted certificate authority. The earliest and most popular of these has been VeriSign. It has been able to charge several hundred dollars for end user certificates, far outstripping the few dollars charged implicitly in the cost of end user software for the security protocol code itself. The bureaucratic process of applying for and renewing certificates takes up far more time than configuring the SSL options. And the CA uh, certificate authority's identification process is subject to far greater exposure than the SSL protocol itself. VeriSign amassed a stock market valuation in the tens of billions of US dollars even before it went uh, into another t trusted third party business, the Internet Domain Name System DNS, by acquiring network solutions. How? By coming up with a solution, any solution, almost as it, it, its security is quite crude and costly compared to the cryptographic components of a public key infrastructure to the seemingly innocuous assumption of a trusted third party made by the designers of public key protocols for email and the web. So what he's pointing out right here is that um, public key infrastructure certificate authorities, which are essentially trusted third parties, um, so VeriSign is one of them. Uh, anytime you see in your browser a lock icon, that's, that's a trusted third party um, as a result of trusting a certificate authority. He's, he's arguing that uh, trusted third parties are the biggest cost in any, uh, any sort of security protocol. So SSL shouldn't cost very much, but the fact that you have a certificate authority, at least at the time that he wrote this, 2001, um, the the actual uh, you know getting the certificate from the certificate authority was actually very expensive, and this is where uh, Verisign made most of its money is uh, is in the tens of billions in issuing SSL certs. Some more problems with CAs are dealt with here. The internet uh, DNS is another example of the high cost and risks imposed by a trusted third party. This one tiny part of the TCP IP protocol stack has accounted for a majority of the disputes and hand wringing involving that protocol. Why? Because it is one of the few areas of the TCP IP stack that depends on a centralized hierarchy of trusted third parties rather than on protocol negotiations between individual internet nodes. The DNS is also the single component of the internet most likely to fail even when its names are not being disputed or proof, spoofed. So he's pointing out that the do domain name service system, uh, which, you know, you know, you can go and uh, get a domain and so on. Um, that's the biggest cost right now and the biggest, uh, biggest uh, thing for disputes and so on uh, because it requires essentially a trusted third party. Um, this is the domain registrar um, and, and so on. The high costs of implementing a trusted third party come about mainly because traditional security solutions, which must be invoked where the protocol itself uh, leaves off, involve high personnel costs. For more information on the necessity and security benefits of these traditional security solutions, especially personnel controls when implementing TTP organizations, see this author's essay on group controls. The risks and costs borne by the protocol users also come to be dominated by the unreliability of the trusted third party. The DNS and certificate authorities being two quite common sources of unreliability and frustration with the internet and public key infrastructures respectively. And this is definitely a part of um, why trusted third parties suck because uh if they they're a single point of failure they go down uh everything goes down with it and it, it the unreliability is a major um uh, you know friction point on uh, in the internet is stick existing trusted third parties are valuable companies like visa dunn and bradstreet underwriters laboratories and so forth connect untrusting strangers into a common trust network our economy depends on them developing de uh, many developing countries lack these trust hubs and would benefit greatly from integrating with developed world developed world hubs like these 
While these organizations often have many flaws and weaknesses, credit card companies, for example, have growing problems with fraud, identity theft, and inaccurate reports and bearings recently went belly up because their control systems had not properly adapted to digital securities trading. By and large, these institutions will be with us for a long time. This doesn't help us get trusted third parties for new protocols. These institutions have a particular way of doing business that is highly evolved and specialized. They usually cannot hill climb to a substantially different way of doing business. Substantial innovations in these in new areas, for example, e-commerce and digital security must come from elsewhere. Any new protocol design, especially par paradigm uh, it, adequately different areas such as capabilities or cryptographic computations will be a mismatch to the existing institutions. Since building new trusted third parties from scratch is so costly, it is far cheaper when introducing protocols from these institutionally novel security technologies to minimize their dependence on trusted third parties. So he's arguing that existing trusted third parties are valuable, but they have a hard problem, um, you know, changing domains, in other words. Um, if you're trusted for one thing, you have a particular way of doing business that's very specialized. And, and if you try to uh, transfer those skill sets to another one, it often doesn't work. New trusted third parties can be tempting. Many are the reasons why organizations may come to favor trusted third party based security over more efficient and effective security that minimizes the use of trusted third parties. Limitations of imagination, effort, knowledge, or time amongst protocol designers. It is far easier to design security protocols that rely on trusted third parties than those that do not. Uh, an example to fob off the problem rather than solve it. Naturally, design costs are an important factor in limiting progress towards minimizing trusted third parties and security protocols. A bigger factor is lack of awareness of the importance of the problem among many security architects, especially the corporate architects who draft internet and wireless security standards. The temptation to claim the high ground as a trusted third party of choice are great. The ambition to become the next Visa or VeriSign is a power trip that's hard to refuse. The barriers to actually building a successful trusted third party business are, however, often severe. The startup costs are substantial, ongoing costs remain high, liability risks are great, and unless there is a substantial first mover advantage, barriers to entry for competitors are few. Still, if nobody solves the trusted third party problems in the protocol, this can be a lucrative business. And it's easy to envy big winners like VeriSign rather than remembering all the new, now obscure companies that tried but lost. It's also easy to imagine oneself as the successful trusted third party and come to advocate the security protocol that requires the trusted third party rather than trying harder to actually solve the security problem. So um, the temptation there is to think that you can be the trusted third party and that you can make a lot of money off of it. This is uh, not unlike altcoins or the, the temptation to create an altcoin, thinking that um, you know what what what's going on here what what uh you know like uh, i i think i can do this just as well um and you know he's right uh, the the cost of creating one is very very easy all right entrenched interests the uh, large numbers of articulate professionals uh, make their living using the skills necessary and trusted third-party organizations for example, the legions of authors and lawyers who create and operate traditional control structures and legal protections. They naturally favor security models that assume they must step in and implement real security. In new areas like e-commerce, they favor new business models based on trusted third parties, application service providers, rather than taking the time to learn new practices that may threaten their own skills. Um, and there certainly are a lot of entrenched interests. Um, that that want to keep doing what they're doing um, that threaten their business model they'd rather be the trusted third party lawyers are kind of a trusted third party in many ways mental transaction costs trust like taste is a subjective judgment making such judgment requires mental effort a third party with a good reputation and that is actually trustworthy can save its customers from having to do so much research or bear other costs associated with making these judgments however entities that claim to be trusted but en not end up not being trustworthy impose costs not only of a direct nature but when they breach the trust they uh, but increase the general cost of trying to choose between trustworthy and treacherous trusted third parties uh, so in other words uh, whenever you have a breach uh, you raise costs for absolutely everybody else 
personal property has not and should not depend it uh, depend on trusted third parties. For most of human history, the dominant form of property has been uh, personal property. The functionality of personal property has not, under normal conditions, ever depended on a tr untrusted third parties. Security properties of simple goods could be verified at sale or first use, and there was no need for continued interaction with the manufacturer or other third parties, other than on occasion repair personnel after exceptional use and on a voluntary and temporary basis. Property rights for many kinds of chattel portable property were only minimally dependent on third parties. The only problems where trusted third parties were needed was to defend against the depredations of other third parties. The main security property of a personnel uh, chattel was often not other trusted third parties as protectors, but rather its portability and intimacy. Here are some examples of the ubiquity of personal property in which there was a reality or at least a strong desire on the part of the owners to be free of the dependence on trusted third parties for functionality or security. Jewelry, far more often used for money in traditional cultures than coins, Northern Europe up to 1000 AD and worn on the body for better property protection as well as decoration. Automobiles operated by and house doors opened by personal keys. Personal computers. In the original visions of many personal computing pioneers, many members of the Homebrew Computing Club, the PC was intended as personal property. The owner could would have total control and understanding of the software running on the PC, including the ability to copy bits on the PC at will. Software complexity, internet connectivity, and unresolved in incentive mismatches between sub software publishers and users, PC owners, have substantially eroded the reality of the personal computer as personal property. So he's talking about you know how much rights do you have over your personal property traditionally it's uh you you can do whatever you wanted with the personal property um trusted third parties have essentially um changed that equation a little bit and that's what he's talking about this desire is instinctive and remains today it manifests in consumer resistance when they discover an un unexpected dependence on and vulnerability to third parties in the devices they use suggestions that the functionality of, the, of personal property be dependent on third parties even agree to ones under strict conditions such as creditors until a chattel loan is paid off a smart lien are met with strong resistance making personal property functionality dependent on trusted third parties trusted rather than forced by the protocol to keep to the agreement governing the security protocol and property is in most cases quite unacceptable so it's a natural instinct to not uh not uh you know accept trusted third parties and for a good reason if your uh you know grill stopped working because it couldn't phone home to your grill manufacturer that would really kind of suck um and Yet, you know, we accept a lot of this stuff for our computers and things like that and a lot of smart devices. And uh, and I can't believe he wrote this in 2001 because obviously there there's a lot of other things that have since come uh, where it doesn't work at all without a trusted third party. Um, Trusted third party minimizing methodology. We now propose a security protocol design methodology where proto whereby protocols are designed to minimize these costs and risks of the trusted third parties. Minimizing the costs and risks of the security protocols themselves is an important but secondary priority. Currently, security designers usually invoke or assume trusted third parties to suit the most elegant and secure or least computationally costly security protocol. These naive trusted third parties are then used in a proof of concept of an overall protocol architecture. But this does not discover the important things that need to be discovered. Once a security protocol is implemented, the code itself costs very little. And exponential cost functions uh, such as Moore's Law keep reducing computational bandwidth and many other technological costs. The cost of the security protocol itself, except for the cost of messaging message rounds limited by the speed of light, and the cost of the user interface limited by mental transaction costs, approach zero. By far, the largest long-term cost to the system, as we learned with P, uh, uh, you know, public key infrastructure, is the cost of implementing trusted third parties. It's far more fruitful to estimate from the beginning what the trusted third parties will cost, rather than trying to design the security protocols to minimize the cost of the trusted third parties. This will likely bring the designer to quite different trust assumptions and thus security protocols than if he or she assumes pure unanalyzed trusted third parties in certain places in order to simplify the security protocol. 
A natural corollary is that if there exists a security protocol that can eliminate or greatly reduce the cost of a trusted third party, then it pays greatly to implement it rather than one which assumes a costly trusted third party. Even if the latter security protocol is simpler and much more computationally efficient. A corollary of trusted third parties or security holes is all security protocols have security holes since no protocol is fully free from, of such assumptions. The key steps in estimating trusted third party costs and risk are to examine one's assumptions thoroughly to uncover all trusted third party assumptions and characterize specifically what each trusted third party is and is not expected to do. Observe that each su such specific hole and task has an associated cost and risk. All right. So in other words, um, he's talking about trusted third parties and essentially security par uh, protocols do have security holes and they impose a cost on the system without, um, uh, you know, without uh, knowing about it. All right, uh, there are very uh, several other important considerations, including design costs. Minimizing trusted third parties often involves learning and applying non-intuitive and complex cryptographic and fault tolerance techniques, like some of those mentioned below. This can be a major burden or impractical for a small smart contract design uh, project. On the other hand, design costs for a novel trusted third party institution are usually much higher than the design costs for a new protocol, as expensive as the latter may be. Determining whether the new institution is robust over the long term is, is more expensive still, while protocols can be formally analyzed and implementations audited against this analysis to achieve a very high level of confidence in a typical product development timeframe. User mental transaction costs. Multiplying uh, trusted third parties, even ones with a reasonably limited function, can quickly tax the ability of end users to track the reputation and quality of the trusted brand, uh, different trusted brands. When trusted third parties are distributed, as in the technology described below, reputation tracking must be automated, which is much easier when the trusted third parties are redundantly perform the same function. So, um, you know, when designing a protocol with a trusted third party, you want to limit it as much as possible. And if possible, remove them entirely because the cost, ongoing costs of any protocol, the trusted third parties tend to be the main sinks. If for a new context like e-commerce, we can find a security protocol which replaces a trusted third party organization, a complex set of traditions quite unproven in the new context with mathematics, which at least in itself is quite clear and provable, will often be a very big win to do so. More often, we will replace a complex, costly trusted third party with one or more much simpler trusted third parties plus mathematics. That too is a big win. We can only tell if and by how much it is a win by focusing on the trust assumptions and the resulting costs of the trusted third parties, rather than focusing on the efficiency of the security protocol. The key is to focus on the cost of the trusted third parties and design the security protocol to minimize them, rather than assuming trusted third parties in order to simplify or optimize the efficiency of the security protocol. So, um, you know, there, there's more design costs ahead of time, but there's, uh, there's a lot better, um, you know, payoffs later on. A good digital security protocol designer is not only an expert in computer science and cryptography, but also very knowledgeable about the traditional costly techniques of physical security auditing law and the business relationships to be secured. This knowledge is not used to substitute these costly security methods for more uh, cost-effective digital security, but in order to minimize hidden dependence on costly methods for the real security. A good protocol designer also designs rather than merely assumes trusted third parties that work with minimal use of costly techniques. Trusted third party minimizing protocols. We saw above that the key uh, keys to minimizing trusted third parties to identify them, characterize them, estimate their costs and risks, and then design protocols around trusted third parties of minimal cost and risk. When the risk is mitigated with techniques like those in this session, it can be very substantially reduced. Three areas of research and implementation show special promise in improving trust. Two of these involve the particularly thorny area of privacy, where breach of trust is often irreversible. Once data gets out, it can be impossible to put back. The first protocol family in which trust can be distributed to preserve privacy is uh, the CHAM mixes. Mixes allow communications immune from third-party uh, tracing. 
only uh, any one of uh, any one out of n proxies in a proxy chain need be trustworthy for the privacy to be preserved. Unfortunately, all n of the proxies need to be reliable, or the message will be lost and must be reset. The digital mix protocol's trade-off is to increase messaging delays, resends in order to minimize the risk of irreversible privacy loss. Another protocol family in which trust can be distributed to preserve privacy is the multi-party private computations. Here, a virtual computer is distributed across n parties who provide specific, specially encrypted input to each other rather than to a trusted third party. The distributed computer takes inputs from each of the n parties computes an out agreed to algorithm that outputs the answer. Each party learns only the answer, not the inputs of any other party. The threshold of parties that must collude to violate privacy or threaten reliability can be traded off and have been studied in detail in the ample literature on this topic. Multi-party private computations can be used for confidential auditing, confidential preference gathering, and data mining auctions and exchanges with confidential bids and so on. This is um, these days called multi-party computing. Um, there's also some zero knowledge stuff in there. Um, you know, it's uh, that the art has improved in the last uh, 19 years since you wrote this essay. A protocol family that replicates data and distributes operations on that data while preserving the integrity of that data are the Byzantine resist, uh, Resilient Replicated Databases. Implementations of Byzantine Resilient Replicated Databases include Fleet and Phalanx. The fleet implements replicated persistence of general purpose objects. Some open source implementations which approach but do not achieve Byzantine resistance, resilience, general purpose or complete decentralization include Moho Nation and Freenet. Applications include secure name registries and property titles, as well as securely published content on, in Moho Nation and Freenet. The most advanced uh, work in this area involves Byzantine fault tolerant quorum systems and other recent advanced in uh, in distributed security. So he's um, he he's sort of uh, you know see, seeing what what's needed for sort of a trustless like a database that's uh, that's distributed and so on. And it's interesting that he brings up Byzantine fault tolerance and and, and so on because this is exactly what Bitcoin ends up um, what, and, and ends up solving. Um, but yeah, ultimately what he what he's talking about is instead of having a single trusted third party, you have multiple parties and they do very small chunks and you know exactly what they're responsible for. And doing that um, increases security and makes it a lot easier. It is important to note that these threshold techniques are only meant to enhance the integrity of a single step or run of the protocol. Practical systems such as Moho Nation combine a majority of or supermajority within a particular run with failure detection and choice by clients of servers between runs. So we can add back all the reputation systems, auditing and so on that uh, add robustness in the long term to distributed systems. The majorities or super majorities within an inv invocation create a very good short-term robustness that is missing from current systems like Freenet and Moho Nation. It's only part, party, partly missing from Moho, which has a four of eight voting scheme, but this has not been shown to be Byzantine resilient up to four of eight. Remote attestation of server code. Remote attestation has been proposed for verifying the state of software running on clients to protect intellectual property. A more valuable use of remote attestation is for verifying the behavior of servers. This is also called the transparent server approach. Through remote attestation, clients can verify that the specific desired code is running on a server. Combined with the ability to audit the code that, uh, as open source, remote attestation of servers can greatly decrease the vulnerability of clients and users to the server. Given the importance of the trusted third-party problem we have discussed here, this approach has vast potential to convert trusted third-party protocols into security protocols and to make possible a wide variety of secure protocols that were uh, heretofore impossible. For example, Halfinny has implemented a version of Bitcoin called reusable proofs of work based on a secure uh, coprocessor board that allows users to remotely attest uh, the code running on the card. While one still needs to trust the manufacturer of the card, this manufacturer is separated from the installation of server code onto and the operation 
of the server on the card. So uh, we talked about uh, reusable proof of work last week, and he's uh, referen referencing this as a way to make trusted third parties a little more, more trustworthy. Leaving so small so holes unplugged. Often this protocol designer can't figure out how to fix a vulnerability. If the attack one, if the attack one needs a trusted third party to protect against is not a serious world, real world threat in the context of the application the designer is trying to secure, it is better to simply leave the small hole unplugged and then to assign the task to a trusted third party. In the case of a public key uh, of public key cryptography, for example, protocol designers haven't figured out how to prevent the man in the middle attack during the initial key exchange. SSL tried to prevent this by requiring CAs as trusted third parties as described above, and this solution cost the web community billions of dollars in certificate fees and lost opportunities to secure communications. SSH, on the other hand, decided to simply leave the small hole unplugged. The man in the middle hole has, to the best of my knowledge, never even once been exploited to compromise the security of an SSH user, yet SSH is far more widely used to protect privacy than SSL at a tiny fraction of the cost. This economical approach to security has been looked at at great length by Ian Grigg. All right, let's uh, let's go uh, finish this up. Not not much uh, left here. Unscrabbling the terminology. Alan Carp, Mark Miller, and others have observed the confusion over words like trust and trusted as used in the security community and proposed replacing the verb trust with is vulnerable too. This substitution is a great way to radically clarify security protocol designs. Trusted third party as used in this essay becomes vulnerable to a third party. And the point of this paper that, uh, and the point of this uh, paper that this is a security hole becomes obvious. In the context of protocol designs, instead of saying the protocol designers trust uh, some little known generic class of parties referred to in the singular as a trusted third party, with a given authorization, which probably really means the protocol designer just can't figure out how to plug a security hole, an honest protocol designer will admit that there is a vulnerability here and that it is up to out-of-band mechanisms or to plug or minimize or up to users to knowledgeably ignore that hole. The class of parties is little known because security protocol designers typically don't know much about the traditional non-digital security legal and institutional solutions need, needed to make such a party trustworthy. The substitution of vulnerable to for trusted works well in protocol design and in communicating honestly about the security of a protocol. Alas, our security designers and sellers of security systems who invoke trusted third parties, trusted computing and the like really going to come out and admit that their protocols are vulnerable? Security design sounds so much more secure when they use the euphemism trust. <laughs> and this is so true of every altcoin. It's, uh, you know, their developers or something like that. Uh, really, you're just vulnerable to their hard forks and so on. In the real world behind the uh, technical context of security protocol design, trust has a variety of meanings. One different use of trust is well-informed trust, for example. I trust this armor to protect me from normal bullets because it's been very well tested. I trust this site with this authorization because we're using a strong security protocol to protect me when I grant this authorization. Or I trust my wife with the kids. In which case, translating trust to and vulnerable to would be to reverse its meaning. That trust can take on practically opposite meanings depending upon the context is another strong argument for avoiding use of, that, uh, of the word when describing the vulnerabilities or lack thereof of security protocols. Whether a designer thinks he does or must trust some generic class of parties is one thing. Whether a particular user will tr actually trust a particular entity in that class when that protocol actually runs is quite another matter. Whether I, uh, either the tr user's trust or the designer's trust is well informed is yet another matter still. Conclusion. Traditional security is costly and risky. Digital security, when designed well, diminishes dramatically in cost over time. When a protocol designer invokes or assumes a trusted third party, he or she is creating the need for a novel organization to try to solve an unsolvable, uh, unsolved security problem via traditional security and control methods. Especially in a digital context, these methods require continuing high expenditures by the trusted third party and the trusted third party creates a bottleneck, which imposes high continuing costs and risks to the end user. 
A far better methodology is to work starting from trusted third parties that either well known that are either well known or easy to characterize and of minimal cost. The best trusted third party of all is one that does not exist, but the necessity for which has been eliminated by the protocol design, or which has been automated and distributed among the parties to a protocol. The latter strategy has been given uh, has given rise to the most promi uh, promising areas of security protocol research, including digital mixes, multi-party private computations, and Byzantine resilient databases. These and similar implementations will be used to radically reduce the cost of current trusted third parties and to solve many outstanding problems in privacy, integrity, property rights, and contract enforcement while minimizing the very high cost of creating and operating new trusted third party institutions. So what's really interesting is uh, He's absolutely right in this conclusion because Bitcoin was created after this. And that, that, that's exactly what it is. It's minimizing trusted third parties. Um, you're, you're not really trusting any third parties at all. In fact, you're, you're downloading it all yourself and, and checking everything for yourself, which is uh, the absolute minimum. There are no trusted third parties in the Bitcoin protocol. And that's the absolute brilliance of it and what he's sort of foreseeing here in this essay. And, uh, you know, it, it's a brilliant essay. And, uh, and I, I, I like the terminology is vulnerable to instead of trusted um, and that's a really really good thing all right um, let me see if there are any questions uh, 50 BTC moved any comments I already wrote an article on this so you can go to my medium at Jimmy song um, I, I, I wrote an article why that's not actually Satoshi probably um, let's see I don't know anything about block really um, Let's see. Hey, Jimmy, how Finney's wife denied his coins were moved. Also, Martin Malmi denied moving his coin, coin, Bitcoin. Who else do you think it could be? Um, I'll, I'll share that on Tone Show later today. I think that's in about an hour and a half. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think Nick Sabo is an absolutely brilliant human being and he, he shows this in his complete, his, his uh, deep understanding of, uh, of security in this essay. And in particular, um, you know, just, uh, what, what's required of a trusted third party and how they tend to be cost things. You can, you can tell, uh, just by reading that he has just enormous amounts of, um, uh, of experience in this thing. And he, he, he brings a lot of that experience to bear in a very practical way by, in this essay by saying, okay, you know, you trust a third party, they end up becoming the major money sinks into in, in any protocol. And, and that's, that, that sucks. Um, that that's uh, less useful for everybody. So, uh, designing protocols around not having a trusted third party is, is, is really the big thing. And that's, uh, um, and that, that's, that's why Bitcoin is just so amazing and why all of these other crap, uh, you know, uh, stuff like proof of stake, which has trusted third parties, uh, distributed proof of stake, which has trusted third parties, hard forks, which has trusted third parties and so on are not really very, you know, they're, they're, you're vulnerable to somebody and that's, uh, that's very different in terms of property rights. And that, that's why this essay is just so important. And so, uh, it's a, it's such a, a breath of fresh air. Anyway, uh, Fiat Delenda Est, this song is done.